Take two. Okay. Good evening, everyone. If I could ask that everyone take their seats. Good evening. Howdy and hello, friends. Ba -ba -da 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 -da. It's event time. I did not plan all the things I was going to say before I got up here. That's how I always start my little song and dance. Everyone, if I could have everyone take their seats. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, if y'all want to go ahead and take your seats too. going to momentarily steal this microphone. Yeah, take your seats. If I could have everyone take their seats, please. Ba -ba -da 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 -da. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, howdy and hello. Welcome, everyone. My name is Lainey Rose. I'm the events coordinator here at East City Bookshop. It is wonderful to be with you all today. Thank you so much for being here in person and for tuning into our live stream if you're watching that way. We love the accessibility that virtual events provide and are also delighted to be able to welcome so many of you back to the store to participate face to face. First up, some housekeeping details. Number one, we appreciate you wearing your mask while you're seated at the event and in the signing line. Masks are optional while shopping or while eating wine and cupcakes, but for our events where we have our, everyone sitting for an extended period of time, we like to keep everyone masked. So thank you for doing your part. Number two, if you need a restroom, it's upstairs past the cash registers and the greeting cards. Number three, if you're watching from home and, it, and experiencing any technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat. My colleague Emma is monitoring that to help if necessary. Number four, we will have time for questions tonight for both in-person and virtual attendees. So even if you're watching via Zoom, you can participate. Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that Emma will see them and can ask on your behalf. And finally, most importantly, if you need to purchase a copy of the book, all of our copies are upstairs and we'd be happy to help you out with that. Um, you can purchase them prior to the signing line. If there's one thing to know about the booksellers here at ECB, we love animals. I'm sure most of you saw our dog wall upstairs. We've had people bring in their dogs, their cats, their pigeons to each of our delight to meet a new furry or feathery friend. For me personally, I wanted to be a bookseller. Uh, before I wanted to be a bookseller, I wanted to be a zoologist, but that didn't pan out. Uh, <laughs> the, the love of animals and the love of reading about animals never quite stopped, though. At the intersection of science, history, and narrative journalism, PEST is not a simple call to look closer at our urban ecosystem. It's not a natural history of the animals we hate. Instead, this book is about us. It's about what calling an animal a pest says about people, how we live, and what we want. And in many cases, it's entirely a question of perspective. Bethany Brookshire's deeply researched and entirely entertaining book will show readers what there is to venerate in vermin and help them appreciate how these animals have clawed their way to success as we did everything we could to ensure their failure. In the process, we will learn about how the pests that annoy us tell us far more about humanity than they do about the animals themselves. Our author of the evening is Bethany Brookshire, an award-winning science writer who was the 2019-2020 fellow at the MIT Night Science Journalism Fellowship. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, The Atlantic, Scientific American, Sierra, Science News, Science News Explorers, and many other outlets. And she's the host on the podcast, Science for the People. She holds a PhD in Physiology and Pharmacology from the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Joining her in conversation tonight is Laura Helmuth, the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. She has been an editor for the Washington Post, National Geographic, Slate, Smithsonian, and Science Magazines. She's a member of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communications. She serves on the advisory boards of 500 Women Scientists and Sciline, a program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that connects reporters with scientific experts. She has a PhD in Cognitive Neuroscience from the University of California at Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming our authors of the evening. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. Um, I think a lot of you may have seen early versions of the book or you know, hopefully have a copy in your hot little hands. It is fabulous. It is such a fun book. I laughed out loud. I shared segments with people. It's funny. It's exciting. It's surprising. Oh, is OK. Uh, put it closer. Close. OK. Yeah, nope. you Thank you. 
yeah, sorry about that. And um, so yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everybody in the virtual audience. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read this book yet, you're going to love it. It's delightful, it's surprising, it's exciting. Uh, we're gonna hear some bits of it uh, from Bethany now. And um, I think to start out, I, I would like to have, you know, if you don't mind, tell us about your muse for this book, uh, your inspiration, um, your closest neighbor. Uh, and I think you, you, you can tell us about it. And I think uh, there's some segments that you might wanna read about, uh, about your muse. He is my closest neighbor. Um, my second closest neighbor, her name is Elodie. She's three and she just she just had to go because of bedtime, but she was here. Um, so just FYI. Um, <laughs> but uh, my first closest neighbor, we come to this feels like this feels like church. We come to the first reading. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm starting from the introduction. Consider the squirrel. Many people love squirrels. People cheer for them and smile as their compact, fluffy bodies race over trees and power lines. Every college campus is convinced their squirrels are bolder than any others. I've got a friend who is here who posts a squirrel picture to Twitter every single day without fail. Squirrels are symbols of fluffy, chipper, charming wildlife come to grace our suburban and urban lives. Then there's me, me and fucking Kevin. Fucking Kevin is an Eastern gray squirrel, Cyurius carolinensis. We call him Kevin for short. He lives in a graceful maple in front of my house. He's a fine chubby figure of a squirrel. His especially busy tail flicks forward over his back as he trots confidently around my property. Kevin is my mortal enemy. This squirrel is the reason I haven't had a tomato from my struggling little garden for at least five years. I'm a poor gardener at best, but every time the weather warms, optimism kicks in and I try again. In years past, I would line big pots up on the back porch and plant seedlings with desperate hope. I've tried most of the usual suspects, basil, zucchini, peppers, but there's a special place in my heart for tomatoes. I have memories from childhood of standing in the middle of my mom's tiny, somewhat dry garden plot in the heat of late July, sneaking cherry tomatoes off the vine and popping them in my mouth. They burst joyfully on my tongue. They were sun warmed and intensely flavorful, the best health food I'd ever tasted. Every spring, I set out to recapture that perfect experience. I sally forth with hope and plant my tomato seedlings. Every summer, I am doomed to fail because of fucking Kevin. There's definitely more than one of him, to be fair. Kevin's probably the godfather of a squirrel mafia. Maybe he's like Batman with different squirrels donning the mask at different times. To me, though, they're all Kevin. He owns my yard. He chitters bossily at me from his tree and makes little threatening rushes at me on the sidewalk. But his biggest crimes occur when my precious tomatoes emerge. They swell up, hopeful and green. Every year I look at them and cross my fingers. Just a few more sunny days and these lovely little beauties will be mine. I start planning menus of caprese salad, ratatouille and salsa. And every year Kevin strikes. He selects a nice plump green tomato and takes a big bite. Suddenly, Kevin recalls that he does not, in fact, like tomatoes. He leaves the perfect green sphere with its tragic tooth marks to rot, making sure to leave it right where I can see it. Then he does it again, and again. It's an aggressive show of constant optimism. Every evening, it seems, Kevin tries out a new tomato and then remembers that tomatoes suck. He leaves his victims for me to find as clear signs of his superiority. For five years running, Kevin has taken a bite out of every single tomato in my garden and stuck me with store-bought salsa. I've tried a lot of things to get rid of Kevin. I put chicken wire around my, around my plants, but squirrel paws and cherry tomatoes are smaller than typical chicken wire holes. I sprayed the growing tomatoes with a cayenne pepper solution to burn his little mouth. He waited, then chowed down after a late summer rainstorm washed it away. I started feeding feral cats on the back porch, thinking a predator or three would keep him at bay. The cats became tame. Two cats came inside and became our new pets. Kevin added cat food to his diet. One year, I tried the nuclear option. I planted no tomatoes. Instead, I filled pots and cups with jalapeno pepper seeds, hoping Kevin would fall for my devious trick. I fantasized about his squeak of spice dismay. I pictured a speedy squirrel retreat and the tears running down his furry cheeks. Squirrels can't weep, but I can dream. He never even tasted one. Neither did I. It turns out I'm such a bad gardener, I can't even keep a jalapeno pepper alive. Many of my friends have heard the story of fucking Kevin. Neighbors know about him. We now call every squirrel in the neighborhood by his name. Most people think it's a silly story of my own incompetence and a squirrel's resourcefulness. It's also the story of a pest. To other people, Kevin is a simple squirrel, perhaps a little smarter than your average rodent. 
He's cute, fluffy, possibly even sweet. To me, Kevin is a constant headache. He makes me feel powerless and foolish. What kind of sciencey person, what kind of adult must I be that I can't keep a squirrel away from my tomatoes? Every dead orb seems to judge me, a silly suburbanite who can't keep a garden alive. And it's all because of fucking Kevin. I have looked up the average lifespan of an adult squirrel. Six years, give or take two or three, and every year I cross my fingers that this is his last. Maybe this spring he'll come down with mange. Maybe he'll eat himself to death on my tomatoes. Or maybe I'll break and buy a BB gun. <laughs> Kevin is evidence of my inability to control my environment. When we are observing squirrels through the safety of our camera lens, when we have nothing they want, they are adorable wildlife. When they have the temerity to nest in our chimneys, move into our attics without paying rent, or use our gardens as an all-you-can-eat buffet, it's another story. Squirrel intrusions into our lives are also indicators of animal success. Species of squirrel hang out on every continent except Antarctica. A group of squirrels, by the way, is called a scurry or a dray. From an original diet of nuts and seeds, they've expanded to french fries and bacon. They're one of the few mammals on the planet that can go down a vertical surface head first. Most are scatter hoarders, burying catches of food for lean times in winter. They have highly accurate spatial memories and can pinpoint exactly where they left precious nuts months after hiding them. I have to have someone call my phone at least once a week because I can't remember where I left it. I admit it. I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you. That's so wonderful. And this is the intro from the book. And I can't imagine anybody opening it up, reading those first few pages, and then not, you know, just <laughs> furiously reading the rest. It's just delightful all the way through. Has anybody else had experiences with a fucking Kevin in your lives? Yeah, not necessarily a squirrel, but probably squirrels, <laughs> monsters. Um, it, rats with good PR. Rats. Yeah, with good PR, yes. A little extra fluff. And that's actually the the one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is is rats. You have kind of a complicated relationship with rats. Um, I don't know if anybody's cl was close has been close enough to see, but um, Bethany has beautiful earrings that are rat hanging. Uh, <laughs> rat, uh, there's a rat on each ear hanging by its little tail, um, going to scurry down her neck. And uh, you, there are rats that you've loved and you know befriended really, and but then you've had some uh, more kind of dark interactions with rats as most of us have. Um, I mean, is this, can you tell us a little bit about how this species became you know, one of the main characters in your book? Um, yeah, I mean, rats are really fascinating to me. Um, rats and mice, actually, I kind of put them together a little bit in my head, um, though you shouldn't, they're different. Though taxonomists are not quite sure how, um, there's a lot on that in the book. There's an entire sideline in the book that's me making fun of taxonomists, sorry. Are there any taxonomists in the building? No. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. You're safe. Carry on. Um, <laughs> I got things to say, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I find them really interesting um, because, well, rats occupy like mice. They occupy two different important niches in our lives. Um, they occupy the niche of the pest, which is kind of like its OG niche. You know, um, the like invades your house, eats your trash, um, but. What I found really interesting is that because of that niche, because of the niche that has made them a pest, we have created another niche for them. We have made them laboratory animals. And it's entirely because they are pests. It is entirely because we hate them, that we feel okay killing them by the literal thousands. <laughs> and I say that as someone who was a scientist for 10 years, and I did do that, and I don't regret it. Um, and you know, it's really fascinating to me how these animals are just human enough to not be human at all. And they're human enough because they're so closely associated with us. And they're not human at all because we can use them for scientific advancement. Um, and I just find that really fascinating. Um, as a pest, though, I also find it exceptionally fascinating that everywhere I've been, everyone has their rat. Every city has a rat. And sometimes it's an actual rat in the city. So sometimes you will have the city of New York has actual rats. But the city of Venice has pigeons. Um, there are cities in Brazil that have lizards. <laughs> um, you know, Miami has a python problem. <laughs> um, everybody, every, every city has an animal that just drives them bonkers. Ooh, Brighton and seagulls. Wow. 
Um, and I just love that. I love that every single city has an animal that they just hate so much, an animal that fills that niche. You've got to have the niche of the outcast. And that is the niche of the pest. Beautiful. And and you've traveled all over for this book. I mean, I think a lot of the reporting was done maybe before you even knew there would be a book. Um, but you've experienced you've gotten very up close to the pythons in outside of Miami and the Everglades, rats all over the place, pigeons, um, bears, uh, wolves. This this book covers a lot of things that are, you know, gross or scary or dangerous or um, bizarre. And as you were doing all the reporting and as you've you know, been working on the book, um, are there any like particularly scary, like <laughs> difficult parts that um, so stood out? Actually, almost all of the research was done after I found out there would be a book, <laughs> almost all of it. Um, and there's not near as much travel as you'd think, because there was this thing, it was called a pandemic. That's why we're all wearing masks right now. <laughs> um, but I did do my best. Um, actually, the part that was the most complex and the most difficult and the most scary was not about animals at all. Um, it was actually the reporting that I did on the four pest campaign in China, um, which is a campaign that took place in the late 1950s um, that had people whole scale killing four pests. Uh, mice and rats were one pest, um, mosquitoes, flies, and sparrows. Eurasian tree sparrows. Um, and this was because sparrows were considered to be pests in grain. Um, they did succeed in killing millions and millions and millions of these birds, um, and like piles and piles. Um, it's fascinating and, and very sad. I feel like it's really awful. But what makes it even worse is that, yes, sparrows do eat grain, but they also eat bugs. They eat crop pests. And without the sparrows, <laughs> there was... Um, a major increase in infestations of pests in the grain, which they believe contributed to the Great Famine, which hit China um, starting about a year or two later and killed between 15 and 55 million people. Um, and that was a difficult one to report, not because of the death, though that was really rough. Um, I mean, like, I'm someone who reads books on plagues for fun, so you know, <laughs> that was, that was the easy part. The hard part was, um, trying to protect my sources. Um, so there are some journalists in this audience who will understand exactly where I'm coming from. I'm staring at you right now. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, you have, um, a duty to do no harm to your sources. Your sources come out for you and they tell you things often very personal things. Um, and in the case of sources who are still living in China, it can be very dangerous for them. Um, to talk about their experiences when they were children killing sparrows. And, and you'd think like, well, that's something the government told you to do. It would be fine. It would be really easy. It's not easy. Um, and so that was actually really difficult. Um, and I would love to credit my not one, not two, not three, but four translators <laughs> who helped me uh, translate not just the conversations I had with people, which involved things like going through WeChat and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger in different combinations of those things. Um, but it also involved um, actually translating documents um, from, for example, scientific, um, scientific literature that actually was brought up at Communist Party meetings um, and things like that. And so it was worrisome, not just for my sources who I spoke to directly, but for my translators. Um, and that was the part that that kind of made me the most nervous. Yeah, so the book is, um, it's very much about pests, uh, but it also has a lot of really rich, interesting history, a lot of important and interesting and humane human characters, a uh, lot of work, a lot of science is woven in, um, a lot of uh, indigenous knowledge, and uh, a lot of adventure. Um, but one, one of the things that struck me throughout it is just how humane it is, how sensitive it is to the relationship between um, people and animals and how a lot of, you know, a, a lot of how animals are defined as pests is, is, is very revealing of um, problems in human society. And if, if you'd like to read this next section, there was just a, a really touching section about rats um, in Seattle. Yeah, we come to the second reading. Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, 
Um, okay. Um, yes, this is from the rat chapter. The sky is leaden and Heather Barr, a supervisor on the Health Education Action Resource Team or HART team at Public Health Seattle and King County, heard a rumor there could be snow. It doesn't smell like it though. It's just cold and damp and depressing in the way only Seattle in December can be. Barr and her team have brought me out to a camp they call 10th and Dearborn after the cross streets. A multitude of tents and tarp covered shacks rises up the sides of the side of the hill and runs along the road, weaving between piles of thick wicked brambles. In between the brambles, the ground is mostly mud, and most tents are on old pallets to keep them off the ground and away from the rats, Barr notes. Barr's team is here to administer COVID-19 tests, which are in high demand, and to see if anyone wants a vaccine, which they can also give. They hand out harm mitigation materials from Narcan to clean crack pipes. They also distribute tents, sleeping bags, tarps, hats, gloves, socks, hand warmers, water, snacks, personal hygiene products, even a few precious donated cell phones anything they can to make living outside just a tiny bit more comfortable. The team parks and opens up their back of their city issued van, pulling flats of water into a wagon and onto the sidewalk. The team's nurse, Dora Henriksen, gets her rapid test ready. People start lining up and Felicia Staley, one of the community health workers, pulls lightly on my arm. Did you see the rat? I turn quickly and see the last bit of a leaf ruffle where the rat dashed out from under the brambles and under the chain leak fence next to the camp to race down a gutter. A woman comes up with a tiny dog on a leash. Tiger looks like he could be part Yorkie and part Shih Tzu, but mostly he's friendly and carefully protected from the cold in a fleece doggy onesie. Tiger's owner, Alexis, has startlingly huge, beautiful eyes, but she is also pale and frazzled. There was a fire that burned down some of the tents the night before and city workers are further down the block, tarsing, tossing char charred, soaked belongings into a truck. She asks about hats and gloves, as well as any chance there might be a room for the night. It's so cold. As the team hands out supplies, there's movement behind the nearest tent. Another rat whisks out of a hole on the hillside and commences trotting back and forth behind the tent, nosing for food. It seems completely unconcerned by the people all around. It's the middle of the day. Rats shouldn't be active at this time, unless there's a very large population and food supply. Alexis and her boyfriend have been living here on and off for years, she says. The rats are a constant problem. They have no fear at all, she says. It sounds horrible, but we use our BB gun and shoot them. It's actually kind of fun. The rats chewed a hole in the corner of their last tent. We were putting cheese in the hole and trying to get them to come so we could shoot them. The two turned their backs for just a few seconds. A rat whisked in, took the cheese, and was gone. Once they get in your tent, they never go away, she says. They'll kick you out. She and her boyfriend and Tiger had to abandon that tent. The heart team walks through the camp, calling politely into each tent to ask if anyone would like a COVID-19 test or a snack. Among the, among the mud and trash, a dead rat lies curled against a beer can. Across the street at the top of the hill, the tents continue, marching down either side of a stairway. Fatima Gulid, another of the community health workers, calls my attention to another rat, dashing between the tents. This isn't actually the rattiest camp, Staley says. In others, the hillsides are pockmarked with holes. Before she took a three-day rat academy course from Bobby Corrigan, she didn't realize what the holes were. At first I was like, oh, there's a lot of snakes out here, she says. Now she knows what they really are, and the whole team is adept at spotting rat signs. A lot of times people bring it up to us, tell us there's a big rat problem, Gulid says. They ask, what can you guys do about it? Barr and her team can't do much. They aren't pest management, though Barr hopes to get someone from environmental health on the team, which might help open more pest management options. Right now, they try to help people living in encampments make do with what they have, handing out trash bags and showing them how to store food safely with the materials they have available. A broom lies between some of the tents, flat in a cleared space where someone had just dropped it. That tells you someone was trying to clean, right, Barr says. She wants to be able to give people experiencing homelessness empowerment and the tools to try to fight back the rats. They start to feel very helpless when they can't get a toehold on things. Um, and I'd love to expand on that a little bit. Um, many of, a lot of the time, we spend a lot of time thinking that rats um, are individual problems. Oh, you have rats in your house. This is a problem of your house. You should close up your house. And yes, you should do that. Pest management refers to the outside of the house as the home envelope. And you should, which sounds so neat. <laughs> and you should make sure you have a solid home envelope with no hole larger than a nickel. Um, actually, so technically rats can get through anything about larger than a quarter and um, mice can get through anything larger than a dime. So a nickel is safe. Um, so, you know, that's that's important. But the really bad rat infestations that I saw, the ones where rats were out in the middle of the day and just out everywhere, are places where rats are a problem of social justice. They are places where 
what people need is not to call pest control. They need a house. They need somewhere that they can protect from pests. And so often we think of rats as personal problems. And this is not a personal problem. This is a problem of society um, and of society deciding that some people are not worth protecting from certain kinds of animals. Yeah, thank you. Um, and one of the things that that was in that selection, the the, the sense of hope of helplessness or hopelessness when when you feel like you're being defeated by pests, um, I think that's something you know that anybody has you know, could potentially experience. Obviously, not at the same level. Um, but uh, there's there's another story in in your book um, that's maybe not entirely yours. It's your story to it's not your story, but it's your story to tell. And it's uh, another example of um, feeling, uh, I guess, overwhelmed uh, by the presence of an animal. Uh, would you would you like to do the honors of that one? Okay. The third reading. We come to the third reading. I can't help it. It really feels like church, you guys. <laughs> Please rise. No. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> one weeknight in August 2021, my friends Emma and Paul names have been changed to protect the slightly embarrassed, had put their daughter to bed in the suburban in their suburban Maryland home. They were sitting in the living room watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine reruns. I heard a rattling sound, Emma says. They've been having mouse problems recently, so she thought perhaps it was another mouse that had ended up in one of their traps. But the sound kept getting louder. I was thinking to myself, geez, we get a rat or something. Then Paul turned around and yelled, what the fuck is that? I found out very quickly what was going on as Emma posted a frantic message in one of our group chats. It was a photo showing a corner of her living room with bookshelves and board games piled on top. There appeared to be a stuffed animal wedged in the very top corner up against the ceiling behind a copy of the game Wingspan. It was not a stuffed animal. We turn around and there's this raccoon on top of our bookshelf where there is normally not a raccoon, Paul says. <laughs> The animal had wedged its nose as far into the corner as it could and was clearly was trying very hard not to be seen. It had most definitely failed. Complete panic ensued. I go into my fight or flight mode, which for me is flight, Emma says. She grabbed her phone, snapped a photo, ran into her daughter's room and locked the door. Paul pointed out that despite her fight or flight mode, she did manage to get a clear picture. The modern panic response, flight. Fly, fight, flight, or photo. <laughs> Frantically Googling animal control, Emma realized their offices were closed. She called 911. The emergency dispatcher told her that they should just wait until the raccoon left. That's when Emily started, Emily started messaging, th Emma started messaging all her family and friends who might be awake. Meanwhile, Paul, a martial artist, grabbed a sword off the wall and stood in the living room doorway. This feels like the bad kind of sword owner thing, Emma says, skewering a wildlife. But neither of them was thinking especially clearly. I wasn't sure if it was going to stay there or if it was going to, you know, run out of the house, Paul explains. I wasn't sure if it was possibly rabid. Luckily, Emma's friends, I was one, were up. We told her to go back, open the door to the living room to the porch, put a can of something smelly, preferably tuna, outside to guide the way, turn off the lights and leave the room. By this point, Paul had already tried donning work gloves and boots and poking at the raccoon with a hiking stick, trying to make it leave. It ignores it, he recalls, except when I poke it a little harder near its head. It bites the stick until I take it away. After some more back and forth over group texts and trials with crackers, sliced ham, and finally tuna, the lights were all off. The glass door to the porch was open and Paul took up vigil by the dining room doorway. The only light was the glow of their nest's home security system, which lit up briefly every time it sensed the raccoon moving in the room. I saw the nest glow, he says, and the glowing was this time accompanied by some knocking and scrambling sounds that sounded really promising to me. And then eventually it just flashed across the room out of that door and did not even stop to consider any of the food. The whole scene, Paul says, felt like it took forever to unfold. We waited for a long time. It was almost midnight by the time he finally left, he recalls. I checked the timestamps from the group conversation. Emma's first panic message arrived at 10.02 p.m. Her relieved, it's gone at 11. The entire episode had taken less than an hour. I can only imagine what it must have felt like to be the raccoon. If this seems like a bit of an overreaction, well, yes. But most people don't have any up close and personal experience with a raccoon, let alone a raccoon inside their house. My only experience with raccoons is them robbing our bird feeders, you know, tearing the bird feeders off our deck and dragging them into the woods, Paul says. 
The pair spent the next few days disinfecting every object in the living room and then finding and boarding up any holes where the raccoon might have entered the house. Paul knows the sword reaction was absurd. In hindsight, the animal was completely terrified. If anything, we should feel pity for it, he says. But that's not the first response to what feels like a threat in the moment. His response was so intense, he says, because he felt like his space had been violated. It's my house, he explains. It doesn't belong to my house, where, you know, we're supposed to be secure from wild animals. In every pest story, the same themes come together. An animal arrives where it's unexpected because it's sliding into a niche, maybe a physical niche on the top of a bookshelf. Perhaps we have given it a new habitat or new opportunities like bird feeders, or maybe we blundered into its habitat in our leafy subdivision. When my friends confronted that raccoon, they felt vulnerable and powerless. They felt disgust and fear and were immediately worried about rabies, which raccoons can spread, and the pain of being bitten. They confronted their own belief that wildlife in their neighborhood was supposed to be a good thing and found it clashing with the belief that their home should be an escape from nature. They saw how animals work their way into a niche and how that habitat changes produced their, that produced their subdivision contributed to it. Some of these things they saw at once, some they saw the next day, and some even later. But at that time, they all boiled down to one thing, get it out. I love that story. <laughs> And uh, you know, especially the writers in the audience, I'm sure appreciate all the the telling details, like the you know the name of the board games and uh, and the timestamps precisely. Always get the name of the dog. Get the name of the dog. Yes. yes. And the name of the squirrel. Uh -huh. <laughs> so um, we're going to open it up now for for questions from you all in the audience, and um, so that people uh, who are watching remotely can understand. Um, what I'll, I'll assuming I can hear it well, I'll repeat your questions so that it can uh, be broadcast well. So um, yeah, anybody have a question for Bethany? What was the most unexpected pest uh, you discovered in your research? Yeah, and so the question is, what is the most unexpected pest you encountered in your research? Oh, that's tough. I mean, everything's a pest to somebody. <laughs> Everybody hates something. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I would say probably there, there definitely are pests that people will find unexpected. Um, and I would say the most unexpected one that people will find um, is probably the African elephant, um, which people are like, oh no, but they're endangered. They can't possibly. <laughs> African elephants kill more than 200 people a year and cause millions of dollars in property damage. <laughs> Asian elephants kill 600 people a year-ish and cause even more property damage. Um, and it's not that elephants aren't endangered and beautiful and awesome. They are. <laughs> I went to Kenya. They're great. <laughs> Love them. It's that they live next to people um, and people are growing crops like corn and everybody loves corn. It's got the juice. <laughs> so yeah, I would say that's probably going to be pretty unexpected to, to most people. To follow up on that, if I may, can you just list some of the, you know, the, the different species that you talk about? Um, sure. I mean, so first of all, the species that I talk about in this book, they're not, I mean, they could be anything. <laughs> you have to understand, like at this, at, when I approached this book, I approached it through themes. Um, and so many other pests could have filled these themes. There could have been feral hogs. There could have been gulls. There could have been, I, there's like half a written chapter on crows that will never see the light of day. Um, there, you know, there's all sorts of um, amazing birds that just didn't make it in here. Um, there are no invertebrates. Um, but so some of the examples, um, so there are rats, there are mice, there are pigeons, there are sparrows. There are elephants. There are house cats. Um, there are cane toads. Love those. <laughs> uh, cane toads, there are raccoons. Raccoons. Uh, there are turkeys, wild turkeys. Um, yeah, and uh, there are snakes, a couple kinds of snakes, um, and deer and black bears. Uh, horses. That's a pretty unexpected one. Um, yeah, but I mean, all of them so many other animals could have filled their place um, because the themes that bring all these animals together and create the idea of a pest um, are the same, no matter what species you're dealing with. Yeah. Um, 
Oh yeah, good question. So the question is, um, you know, one of the examples we talked about earlier is lab mice and how they've, you know, transformed in some cases from pests to, uh, to, uh, to mice that we use for research that you know have a have a new use. Are there some other examples of that? So yeah, and that's such a good question that I I feel like maybe you've read the book, but I actually don't think you have. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so yes, and actually one of my favorite examples of this is pigeons. Um, so I love pigeons. Um, and the great thing about pigeons is that pigeons didn't used to be a pest. We domesticated pigeons deliberately around 5,000 years ago. Whether they are the oldest domesticated bird is a matter of some debate. Some people think geese are older. Um, anyway, so uh, we domesticated the pigeon and we did it on purpose because the pigeon has all sorts of great stuff that we like. They produce poop. We love poop. It makes great fertilizer. Um, they produce tasty pigeon. <laughs> which is delicious. Um, and they also have this amazing virtue in that they leave home every day, feed themselves, and then come back to exactly where they started every night without fail. And this does not matter how far you take them. So you can take your pigeon 200 miles away and you can release it and the pigeon will come back. It might take a while, but it'll, it'll come back. Um, and so people loved this and we domesticated the pigeon on purpose. And now we have cell phones and chemical fertilizer and chicken, and we don't need the pigeon anymore. And so we let it go. And the pigeon did what the pigeon has always done. It went out, it fed itself, and it came back to where it lived, which is also where we live. <laughs> and now we're mad. <laughs> and I just love that. <laughs> Like everybody's looking at this pigeon being like, oh, it's a rat with wings. I'm like, I don't think you understand. <laughs> this thing's amazing. Yeah, please. Ooh, good one. Yeah, the question is, do any pests have pests? Oh, Lord, yes. <laughs> um, so there are no invertebrates in this book. Um, but almost every animal species, for example, um, many mammals have their own kind of highly discriminating flea that prefers to eat them. Um, so for example, there are human fleas that prefer humans and other primates um, to other animals. There are rat fleas that prefer rats um, to other animals, though they will bite humans when given the opportunity. <laughs> um, and um, there are, uh, my favorite actually story of this is uh, the cane toad in Australia which was brought to Australia, Team Cane Toad, um, brought to Australia to take care of a pest deliberately. Like people were against the cane beetle, which was eating sugar cane. And so they brought in the cane toad to get rid of the cane beetle. This did not work because cane beetles, see when they're larvae, they're underground and cane toads do not dig. And then when the cane beetles are adults, they fly and toads do not. And so the toad, <laughs> did not do very well. <laughs> um, but anyway, th there's more on that in the book. Uh, but one of the things I loved was the note that, well, at least they like picked all the ticks off the toads before they brought them over. <laughs> but they didn't actually get rid of the main pest of the cane toad, which is lungworm. And the cane toads in Australia carry lungworm to this day because of that. Um, so yes, every, every animal has its parasites. And that's one way to look at pests as animals that are kind of like external parasites living on our ecosystem. Um, I prefer to think of them as members of our ecosystem that we merely fail to appreciate. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the question is, are there, were there challenges um, specifically in reporting this book that are different from some of your earlier reporting? Um, well, it was a lot more fun. And like, I feel bad saying that. Um, but no, it's, it's mostly because most of my reporting um, when writing for magazines and writing for the news, you kind of have to do over the phone. People don't really want to just like send you to Kenya <laughs> um, to write a one page piece, <laughs> which is completely understandable. <laughs> um, and so I would say the biggest difference is that I got to go to Kenya. <laughs> Um, and also California and the Everglades and the Florida Keys. And it was really fun in Massachusetts. Um, so that was like the biggest opportunity. Um, and that was incredibly special um, because there really is something so much more powerful 
about experiencing something firsthand, like touching it, smelling it, hearing it, seeing it, walking into a lab and realizing the lab studies skunks. <sighs> not over it, still not over it. <laughs> I smelled a lot of weird stuff for this book. That was one. Um, you know, th there's really nothing that compares to that in terms of kind of getting amazing reporting, <laughs> just being able to see that um, and being also able to build up relationships with um, some of the people who I talked to for this book. Um, though because of COVID, unfortunately, I actually couldn't um, build up a lot of the relationships that I really wanted to. Um, so someday. Yeah, there's one way in the back. <laughs> oh my god so for the for the people at home um this is this is apparently a really good question <laughs> so in grad school the questioner says uh they heard that one of the reasons that lab mice and lab rats became lab animals is that there was a victorian tradition of of kind of fancy breeders um and so there were already inbred strains that um were pretty you know genetically homogenous and that you know, could potentially be useful for science um is there any truth to that so <laughs> yes and <laughs> yes and eugenics oh yeah <laughs> it's good um okay so um yes there was this fancy mouse um and fancy rat the rat fancy is what it is called actually and the mouse fancy someday i hope to breed my own fancy mice but right now my cats would be way too interested in that um and my my thing is like when when i'm saying these are fancy mice they have like curly hair they have like long hair that is blue <laughs> naturally <laughs> these mice are insane looking and I'm really sad that my lab mice were just like little black mice and not like awesome long curly haired <laughs> divas <laughs> very sad um but yes so originally um scientists did start using rats and mice um because they were easy to get from the rat and mouse fancy um and in particular um her name was Abby Lathrop I think um, she was a breeder and cataloger of mice. Um, and she actually supplied some of the first mice to what will become the Jackson Laboratory, which is what we call the House of Mouse, um, <laughs> what scientists call the House of Mouse. Um, but it actually gets wilder from there. So mice and rats were kind of a niche thing in genetics, um, even though they were really pretty inbred. Um, there were only a couple of strains. Um, they were really super inbred and they would have remained kind of a small sideline. Um, people were really into using other things. Beagles were very popular. Yes. Um, and so they were kind of a sideline until, <laughs> until Jackson, um, the dude who would, um, at CC Little, the guy who founded the Jackson Laboratory, um, he uh, started breeding all of these inbred species uh inbred breeds of mice and in part he started to do that because he was a eugenicist and he was trying to create the perfect mouse <laughs> to go with the perfect man um and in the depression the laboratory jackson laboratory lost a lot of money and they were like oh no what are we going to do they started selling the mice and it turns out scientists wanted to buy the mice <laughs> so it started going pretty well and then world war ii happened and then they were like wow eugenics is not an angle we should keep going with that was a bad idea. Um, and so Little was like, all right, from now on, we're selling mice. We're doing this. But what was wild was he had to convince scientists and the public to buy them. He had to convince scientists to buy them and use them. And he had to convince the public that this was a palatable thing to do. And so he did. And there is a famous article <laughs> that I looked up in Scientific American <laughs> written by CC Little. And my favorite is the opening line, which is, do you like mice? Of course you don't. And he sold mice to the public and the Jackson mouse was born. Um, so yes, it, it is absolutely true that it comes from the rat and the mouse fancy. Um, so do uh, laboratory pigeons, which are still a thing today, um, come from the pigeon fancy. Um, but yeah, it, it gets, it goes weird places. <laughs>
Oh yeah, good question. This is from uh, from someone in the virtual audience. What influenced your decision to not include invertebrates for this book? Would you want to buy a book full of centipedes? I mean, I would, but I, I... if you wrote it, <laughs> I would. Um, no, um, no, I actually, <laughs> I did actually have a um, a reason. Um, it's because um, when I was looking at the themes in this book um, and kind of how these animals come into our lives and how we see them those themes come through just so much more strongly with vertebrate species. Um, the reality is that when you see a roach in your house, you're going to smoosh it with a shoe and a small feeling of triumph. When you see a mouse in your house, you're going to feel bad. And I wanted to kind of make sure that we felt that dichotomy, make sure that we felt that weird moment of, should I kill this? I hate this. Should I kill it? <laughs> Um, because I think that's the thing that kind of makes us reconsider why we hate some animals. Um, and from there, maybe we can explain, we can expand it. Um, I don't know that there are any live traps out there for roaches, though. Oh yeah, good question. So it's uh, what's the difference between an invasive plant and an animal pest? That's a good question. So interestingly, when you talk about the, um, I would say the the difference is entirely perspective and buy-in. That is the difference. Um, so first of all, most people would define a weed as a plant out of place. So an invasive plant would be a plant that is out of place, going somewhere else and succeeding. If the plant goes somewhere else and dies, that's fine. We're okay with that. Um, but when it starts succeeding, then it becomes an invasive species. Uh, and the same is true of animals. Um, the same is true of animal pests. These are animals that are living in environments associated with humans and that are succeeding wildly. And I find this so fascinating in particular because um, when we build new subdivisions, say, and we start like pushing a salamander out of house and home. We get so sad. What have we done? Save the salamander. There's going to be a, there's going to be t-shirts. There's going to be pins. We're going to do fundraisers. We're going to save the salamander. We're going to restore its habitat. But if you move into that area and the salamander is like, oh, this is great. And starts living all over your basement and doing really well. <laughs> all of a sudden you are not happy. <laughs> You're not at all happy. <laughs> um, and, and that's just so fascinating to me. Oftentimes, the things we hate are the things that are successful um, in spite of us. Um, and I would say also the big difference between invasive species and pest is often a matter of conservation buy-in. Um, so for example, when conservationists um, or environmental scientists decree that something is an invasive species, they kind of add scientific backing to the idea that this animal needs to leave. Um, this is not to say that they are wrong. Just that it is, you know, the invasive species is a very, you know, scientific term. Um, whereas a pest, like, that's not something a scientist is going to use. That's not a term. That's more like common use. And if you are a normal person and you say pest, often a scientist will say, well, no, well, actually. <laughs> right. Where if you say invasive species, they'll go, oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, good question. So this is, have, have humans gotten any better at not introducing invasive species everywhere? Is this anything we've gotten better at over time? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> so uh, you know how you're ordering Christmas presents right now, and those Christmas presents are going to come on giant tankers from China. So those tankers take on water as ballast. And in the water, that is in the ballast, um, there is all sorts of stuff, <laughs> sometimes fish, but usually like small invertebrates, um, things like that. And then when they return to their original port of call, they will drop their ballast. And all of the species <laughs> that are in those ballast tanks will end up in places like New York <laughs> or San Francisco. Um, and there are efforts to try and reduce this issue. Um, they're trying all sorts of different things. Um, but certainly, no, we, we still introduce... <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, it, it's amazing. Every time um, 
environmental scientists go and they like drop tons and tons of poison onto an island to try and get rid of all the rats on the island or something. They are left policing it forever because rats will come back. <laughs> they will. Um, so yeah, no, I don't think we have. I think I think we're just as bad as we've ever been, honestly, in part because our we're more careful, but we're also so much more well-traveled. You know, it's no longer like cool 18th century wooden boats. You know, it's planes <laughs> and, you know, tr planes and cars and trains and boats and people's backpacks. You know, like it, it, people go everywhere. How do I find staff? So someone who's from New York, and who's cooking for the church, um, who's doing food trade, but it's, it's not just the rats and they're, they're everywhere. So as we humans live in this place and share this place with any number of cultures, where do we find that cohabitation? Um, yeah, so this is a, a question about how do you find balance? Um, you know, rats are everywhere, pigeons are everywhere. How do we find some some measure of, of cohabitation? So that's a very good question. Um, first of all, what has a pigeon ever done to you? Because the answer is literally just exist. <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to think of a time a pigeon has ever actually injured a person and I'm coming up empty. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, this is actually one of the things that I really appreciated about reporting this book is that I was able to learn from a bunch of different cultures that are not mine. Um, and in particular, I was able to learn from a lot of indigenous groups. Um, and they were super patient with me and really kind because I'm super ignorant. Um, and what I found is that this idea of animals as untenable of us needing to live in an animal free space. The idea that humans are separated from nature, that is not universal and it never has been, like not even close. There are cultures around the world um, that do not believe that. They behave in very different ways. Um, and that really changes their outlook. If you believe that you live in an ecosystem and that other animals also have a right to be in that ecosystem, it changes how you deal with them. Um, and it changes what you think about. So for example, um, one of my favorite examples is that one of the um, Diné elders um, who I spoke with, um, it's a Diné is another word for the Navajo. Um, and one of the elders that I spoke with, he told me, well, you know, if a mouse gets into your house um, and you are Diné, he's like, yeah, you're gonna get a trap out, like that's a thing. Um, but you're also gonna ask, why is the mouse there? you are not gonna say this mouse has no right to be in my house. You are going to say, why is this mouse here? What did I do to attract the mouse? Because mice have skills and their skills involve getting into your house and you have skills and your skills involve keeping your house clean. So if a mouse is in your house, that mouse is sending you a message and that message is clean your house. <laughs> um, and I really appreciated that view. And that was something that I have kind of come to think about. I think that part of the reason we hate animals so very much is because we're so into starting a war. We're not just going to defend ourselves and these animals. We are going to launch a preemptive strike. We are going to dump poison all over this island. We are going to shoot those feral hogs from helicopters, BYO AR-15 right? Like we are going to do this. And we don't, are, we don't need to change that much. Just maybe we should try to think a little more defensively instead of offensively, right? Maybe ask, why are the pigeons there? Why are the pigeons in New York? Why are the rats in New York? And the answer is there is food. As long as you keep leaving loads and loads of food and in, for pigeons in New York, this can take the form of trash, but it can also take it the form of the many people who feed pigeons on purpose. Not just tourists, there are people who are dedicated um, pigeon feeders and will buy huge bags of birdseed to feed pigeons every day. Um, and if you work with those people and you reduce the food, you reduce the pigeons. Like we don't need to use... Um, Oh, one of my favorite pigeon removal tactics is this gel. It's an optical gel called bird fire. <laughs> bird fire. <laughs> and it is not fire. It just, to a bird, it looks like it's on fire. So the idea is the bird will not land on it. This does not work. <laughs> but instead of investing all this time and money in bird fire, 
or pigeon spikes or angled things on your masonry, you know, stop feeding the birds. Sorry. <laughs> so somebody in the audience said, then what will my raccoons eat? Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, good question. So earlier we talked about um, half a chapter on crows that didn't make it into the book. And the question is, is there anything from, from that that you want to share? Um, yeah, well, not specifically about crows, um, just because a lot of other people write about crows. And so I thought crows were kind of overdone. I love some crows though. Like New Caledonian crows not only use tools, they make tools. They will take a twig and they will be like, this twig is not the right shape for the thing that I want to do. And they will bend it into a hook. <laughs> That is a bird. <laughs> that is a dinosaur with goals. I love it so much. Um, so uh, what I mostly kept in from that was um, the innovation, um, the animal innovation and the animal brilliance um, that not just crows, but many other animals display. Um, so I kept, there's a large section in there on kind of like animal smarts <laughs> and how awesome they are. Okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, good one. So pests are incredibly successful ecologically. Are there any lessons to take away about survival? Oh man, eat everything. Do not be a picky eater. Picky eaters don't make it. That's that's it. Um, no, one of the things I think is is fascinating about this is we humans spend a lot of time thinking that we're destroying the planet and we're not doing great stuff. Don't get me wrong, we're doing some pretty bad stuff. Um, but we also spend a lot of time thinking we're driving a lot of species to extinction. And we are. And it's very easy to think, oh, we are really good at driving species to extinction. Then you try to get rid of a Burmese python in the Everglades. We are so bad at this, you guys. <laughs> we are so bad at this. <laughs> we can't get rid of brown tree snakes on Guam. The problem is so bad, no one's even tried. <laughs> Like, there are so many animals that we call pests that, like, we think that we're these, you know, amazing mass murderers of wildlife. And these guys are just walking around being like, hmm, that's cute. <laughs> I just, I just love that about them. But yes, that your main technique for survival is eat anything. Uh, we have time for one more question. Anybody want to take that? Yeah. Oh yeah, the question is um, in the reporting of the book, how much interaction did she have with with people who keep some of these spe these pest species as pets? So I have two cats, um, and they have a chapter in the book. So one of the best things about writing a book is you can include what you want, including extensive discourse on your own cat. Um, <laughs> sorry, not sorry, she's great. Um, but um, no, I actually didn't spend too much time. Um, because I was interested in kind of why people hate these animals as opposed to why people love them. Um, but it was really fascinating to me to see people who not only, who do, don't necessarily keep these animals as pets, but it seems like when we approach wildlife and we see wildlife, we have this kind of bifurcated reaction to it. On the one hand, we go, it needs to die. How do I kill it most efficiently, preferably out of sight? And then there's the, I need to feed it and I need it to eat from my hand. And I need to have a Disney princess moment. <laughs> and it is amazing. The number of people who feed corn to deer every single day, who feed bears on purpose, who feed raccoons, like whipped cream from the can, like the raccoon comes up and they just open their mouth and they, I'm quite serious. And like, not all, that's bad. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you know, people desperately want to be close to nature and they forget that we already are. We are close to nature often in the animals that we hate, in the animals that live with us. You know, we don't need to get the little song sparrow to land on our hand and tweet us a little song. You know, we can look at the pigeon 
or the sparrow or the crow. And that's nature. It's nature right there. And we could look at it and we could learn at it, learn about it. You know, we don't have to necessarily go out and try to domesticate every single animal we see. <laughs> that often ends badly. So thank you so much for the great questions. Thank you, Bethany, for writing this book, for meeting with us, for talking about it tonight. And thanks so much to our, our host. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight, everyone. We are now going to transition to our signing line portion. Um, so we, I'm going to bring out a little table, a little Sharpies, and we're going to get the show on the road. If you are willing and able to help us with the chairs, if you don't mind just picking up your chair and sending it to the side, um, a staff member will be coming by and doing that. If you'd like to purchase copies, we still have copies upstairs. Also, our science section is right here, should you want to peruse it. And we thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you.